Ah, supplements. I tend not to be a huge fan, but after analyzing 49 studies on these six, I have a better grasp on what has been shown to work in the scientific literature and what hasn't. So I'm going to show you what works and why I avoid certain common supplements like Glynac and NMN and give you a rating for my certainty behind each supplement with one being low certainty based on the evidence and five being the highest certainty. The first one is one that I've been fond of for over a decade, creatine. Creatine is a pretty remarkable molecule that has had a tremendous amount of research done on it. My investigation was focused on brain health and cognition, and while the results were not as evident as I'd thought that they might be in areas like uh, memory aid, there were still some benefits. For example, while creatine did not seem to provide any memory benefit to people who are younger than 60, it did seem to provide a benefit for those 60 and older. If the black diamond there moves to the right, that means that there is a benefit of creatine. As you can see in the first group of younger individuals, there's no benefit, but in the second group, there is a benefit. Now that said, I'll still take it, although I'm not 60 years old, and I've been taking it now since I was 19 or so. So why? Because while the memory benefits of creatine may not apply to me, although side note, there is some data it helps in other brain measures aside from memory, it certainly helps with the musculature. So while one tissue may get minor to no benefits, another tissue reaps significant benefit, especially when resistance training, and that applies to all ages. I take five grams a day. My rating for creatine is five out of five. Next up is collagen. I've only investigated collagen in respect to the skin, so I'm limiting the scope of my point to that until I get a chance to pour over the data on collagen in other areas. So I went over 11 studies on collagen, and while some of them weren't the greatest quality, some were good. Ultimately, I decided that collagen is a benefit, and although I do still think that we need more data, unlike creatine, it was good enough to convince me of its merit. I take it daily in collagen peptide form and I take 10 to 20 grams. My rating for collagen is a 2.5 out of five. What about Glynac? Well, I had an incredibly popular video that went over three of the major studies on Glynac, two of which were in humans, and the results were really astonishing, with massive improvements in a series of health markers from mitochondrial health to muscle strength to blood pressure, and the list goes on. Really impressive stuff. So you might be wondering why I don't take it then. Well, that's because it causes instant death by brain melting. <laughs> nah, I'm just joshing you. Uh, it's because the studies were performed in people in their 70s. And again, I don't know if we've been over this, but I'm not 60 and I'm also not 70. I firmly believe that Glynac will be of little to no use to anyone in their 20s, 30s, and maybe even in their 40s if you take care of yourself. So it's still useful and still impressive, but probably a waste of your money if you're on the younger side and healthy. Now, the doses that they used in the studies were really high, which leads them to be pretty expensive and a pain to consume. But here they are, 100 milligrams per kilogram of body weight of each. So if you weigh 100 kilograms, you'd be consuming 10 grams a day of each. That's a ton. I was having a conversation with one of the Physionic Insiders about dosing, and I think it's likely a smaller dose that's going to be just as effective. My rating for Glynac is a 1.5 out of 5. Why so low? Not because I don't believe the science that I just presented, but because it only came from one laboratory. And while that lab may be reputable, I'd like to see the results confirmed by independent teams. Next up is fish oil. Fish oil has been studied in many contexts, but I limited my investigation to cognition, brain function. Now, if we look at this summary of the data, we can see a few different measures and then a bunch of numbers. I'm not going to burden you with all these numbers, except this column called the Hedges G. 
This signifies what is considered an adjusted effect size. So it tells us the magnitude of the effect or the amount of impact that omega-3s have on these indices of brain function. Anything 0.2 and under is minuscule. So as you can see, while there is an effect, the effect is small, even in the largest measure, memory. Still, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It's just a small effect. Better to have a little than nothing, except cyanide. I prefer nothing when it comes to cyanide. So the researchers mentioned the median dose is around 800 milligrams, and some studies went a bit higher. I take about a gram. My rating for fish oil is a 3.5 out of 5. I still think that there's some need for added data, but the data that is there is relatively consistent, at least in measures of memory. The other supplement that I don't take is NMN. NMN has been really popular lately because it's been hailed as this age-reversing molecule that can replenish our cellular stores of NAD and give us everlasting life. Okay, that last part is a bit of an exaggeration on my part. Well, I read 13 studies on NMN in humans, and I think it's all the studies in humans up to this point, and the results were mixed. Some studies showed an effect, others didn't. However, the studies that showed an effect, only two of them showed a noticeable effect, and the rest of them indicated tiny effects. Remember when we discussed the Hedges G? They didn't quantify it like that, but it would be equivalent to a minuscule effect in those studies. So, what gives? Well, my current interpretation is that NMN is likely useless for young, healthy individuals. So if you're in your 40s and younger and you take care of yourself, defined by a diet that keeps you trim and you exercise, it's unlikely that NMN will have any noticeable effects. However, maybe if you're older or have a less than desirable diet and lifestyle like smoking and taking strolls through radiation fields, then NMN might offer some benefit. The exact strength of that benefit is up in the air. Studies used between 200 milligrams and two grams a day. Now, people will often argue that 200 or 250 milligrams is too little, yet those same studies showed increases in NAD, the molecule that NMN is converted to. And some of those studies also showed a physiological improvements. So clearly that low dose is enough to elicit an effect. I remain unimpressed for most people. I'll add an amendment to this video if that changes, but I won't be using it. My rating is a two out of 10 because there are double digit randomized placebo controlled trials on the topic, but clearly we need much more granularity. So we need many more studies to reach that granularity. What's next? Curcumin. Again, this is an area where I focused my attention in one general camp, diabetes risk. I did run across a few other ancillary measures like body weight, triglycerides, and so on. But by and large, I was focused on blood glucose and insulin resistance. What I discovered is that ultimately, it was determined that curcumin is remarkably potent for helping someone keep diabetes at bay. It acts as a potent protector to keep a person who is pre-diabetic from becoming diabetic. Of course, it'll only hold off for so long, but if you are borderline, adding curcumin into the mix can be a life-changing decision. As one example, look at this data. This is the comparison of people who went on to develop diabetes. So on the right are the people who took curcumin and on the left are the people who didn't. By the 12 month mark, 16% of those that did not take curcumin developed diabetes and not a single person in the curcumin group developed diabetes. Those are wonderful results. Unfortunately, on measures of blood sugar, if you have normal, well-regulated blood sugar, curcumin is of little use to you. That said, there are other benefits of curcumin that extend beyond blood sugar and insulin resistance. So it may be still worth your while to consume, but I choose not to because it is a potent antioxidant and antioxidants have been shown to reduce muscle building potential, which is antithetic to my goals. I'm also healthy enough. Now, the studies used range in dose between 200 and 1500 milligrams a day, but I'd opt for anything over 500 milligrams. I'd rate curcumin a four out of five. There's a good amount of research on it and it's relatively consistent too. 
But you know, while supplements can be a benefit, clearly there's much greater health benefit by following the five rules that I outlined in this cornerstone video right here. I think that you'd be doing your health a disservice by not watching it. But if that's not your cup of NMN, I could always encourage another one of my videos. You'll learn regardless if I can cheekily say, thanks for watching. Bye.